when you're there and you're, you know, doing these missions, you know, you plan and you prep and you take every step to ensure that you guys are gonna make it. But you always have to be prepared for an unsuccessful mission. You can do the best you can to survive, but you can't control everything. Bucket loader was moving up to the, uh, the far end of the canyon to cut the road for us or to help improve the road for us to get our vehicles up in there. About three quarters of the way up, they, the Afghans had dug this uh, irrigation like trench. And it was large enough to where we weren't capable of driving our vehicles over top of it. So we get the bulldozer, and the bulldozer, you know, scoops up some earth and rock, and it's driving up the side of the mountain, and it goes and drops some stuff inside this uh, irrigation ditch. As the bucket loader was clearing the, the road and the path, it kind of tiptoed on its, on its side and rolled over. And this 18-ton, you know, bulldozer comes crashing down on top of itself. And uh, we were stuck uh, at that point. You know, we knew that we were in trouble because we kind of have the ability to hear the enemy. They use radios sometimes that we're capable of, you know, intercepting their transmissions, and we have interpreters. And all of the interpreters were like, hey, they know that the vehicle is down, and they're calling for all the fighters in the region to come to this area because there's only one way that we can get back out. So after the bucket loader rolled, we had some Afghan forces with us who we sent to the high ground to uh, secure it. And then Romy and I cleared the, uh, the high ground uh, villages up there. So we were able to secure the canyon pretty, pretty well. And then uh, we basically waited the night out to see if we got called from the uh, other uh, unit uh, for support. So we stayed there until the mission was complete, basically. I want to say it was about eight hours until we finally got permission to blow this thing up and return to base. So uh, Romy and uh, uh, Ruiz, our engineers, who are explosive experts, uh, they went up there and they, you know, rigged the uh, bucket loader with explosives. We needed to make sure that it was destroyed and that the enemy couldn't end up, you know, taking it apart and then reassembling it. We strapped a lot of explosives to it and blew it up to where all the pieces would be inoperable. We decided to return to base because that was a, a lot of explosives to blow that big of a piece of equipment. You know, we had just made a big signature and we drew a lot of attention to ourselves. And I remember as we were pulling out, the, the ambush kicked off. The ridge lines and the mountain just, just lit up. It was about 25 to 30 insurgents at the time. They were coming from the wood line in the village, the high ground. It was pretty chaotic. RPGs, rifle fire, AK-47s all over the place. You can see the tracers, the green tracers, red tracers, I mean, all around us. I'm returning fire and I had to reach down to grab some more two or three grenades. And then all of a sudden, that's when I felt like a punch in the back of the head. That's the only thing I remember from that part. I heard the call that Roman was shot and they need all medics to his truck. 
All medics come to this drug, Chief's been hit. As soon as we got the call and we were the vehicle right behind him, we were there. I mean, we're talking 30 seconds. Our vehicle pulled up right next to theirs. So I was in the top of our vehicle. I jumped out and into the back of their vehicle where he was shot. And then that's when I started um, doing my, uh, my treatment. I saw Romy and well, there's blood everywhere. I cut his body armor and stuff and I was going through my treatment protocol and we originally thought it was a glancing gunshot wound, like it just clipped him. It actually, it came in the left side in his hairline and, you know, when we're there, we're usually, our hair's long, you don't, know, you know, you grow your beards out and stuff, trying to fit in with the local populace and, uh, so you couldn't even see the entrance wound. Then when I did my initial sweeps on him, I didn't even know. But I just knew because it was a gunshot wound to the neck, I'm assuming there's C-spine involvement. Your C-spine, it goes through the spinal canal. And if something's moved, you can cause more damage. So I said, maintain C-spine until I tell you otherwise. I knew that he had to have an airway. And if we were to intubate him, that would have required us to, you know, change the position of his head, which if we moved his head back like that, then all of that spinal cord damage, it, it probably would have severed his C-spine, he would have died. I wasn't gonna let him die. I wasn't gonna let him die. I didn't have any crike, anything, no trach hooks, nothing, just the razor blade and an ET tube. And I take it and I, I, I pass the tube in and, and it felt, felt right going in. I'm like, all right, it's passed. And I got placement. I got the bag and I'm having to straddle him, bag and give him air and then engage the enemy until we could fight ourselves to a safe location and actually call for a medevac bird in. Of course, as soon as we, you know, circled up in that open area, uh, my gunners all sat on the guns and, and were firing at the uh, at the high ground, and then we went over to uh, Romy's truck. When I looked at his eyes, they were leathery, black leathery. You know, Romy's dead. We're all in there, you know, cussing Romy out to breathe. You know, breathe, breathe. And, uh, and he did. And I remember seeing his chest rise and fall, and then immediately his co color started coming back. Steve saved his life. And when he gasped that, that breath, I mean, it just, hey, man, he's, he's going to make it. The medevac, they didn't want to come in because we were taking direct fire. They didn't want to come into a hot LZ. Medivac must have said, we're going to land no matter what, because they came in. If you'd see the canyon where they had to land, and knowing that we were taking fire up to the last minute, uh, I'm surprised they landed. And uh, right as the bird was coming in, they're like, you're going with them. I remember looking out the side of the bird as we started to pull out and the team starting to move on again. And I remember seeing the ridge lines and the, and I remember them shooting, you know, their machine guns and just taking a moment and praying and saying, God, please watch over them. And uh, I looked down and Romy's got his eyes open and he mouths to me, what happened? And uh, of course, you know, I was a wreck and I was like, you got shot, dude. I was like, but you're okay. You're stable. We're, we're getting you out of here. You're going to see your family soon. And uh, I just remember him. He always does this thing with his lips. And he goes like that. And he closes his eyes. 
I'm here today because of those guys. And to me, they're just, they're all my brothers. That's what being SF is about. You know, you love the guys on your team and uh, you've got to have that tight bond with them. That, you know, that's, that's, that's what you do. You know, that's your job. That was the beauty of that team. Everybody knew what their job was. It's almost like nothing had to be said. Everybody just knew what they had to do. And that is what made it so amazing. I'd do it all over again. Wouldn't change a thing. I don't even think about it. <laughs>